I am not the type of scholar who frequently uses the words rare or unique in reference to objects. In fact, more often than not, I take a realistic, perhaps even cynical approach to objects that tends to place them within wide networks of production and disrupt these ideas of singularity. I suppose it is fitting then that an anonymous mid 19th century stoneware decorator with possibly a similar cynical outlook to mine is going to force me to use those words. This four gallon salt glazed stoneware jar currently attributed to the Parr family pottery in Richmond, Virginia offers us a unique glimpse into a different perspective on the outbreak of the American Civil War from the sectionalistic or nationalistic ones that we often glean from the period. Rather, it is one that is decidedly displeased with all sides all around. Before I delve into the jar and its iconography, I should mention that some of its subject matter is fairly violent and frankly offensive. Additionally, in order to contextualize the piece within the broader field of visual culture from this period, I will be showing you some material today that is likewise highly problematic and troubling. So buckle up. Uh, the jar is decorated with cobalt brushwork on all sides. Viewed from this angle, the unassuming jar looks like a peon to the Confederacy. It is marked with the CSA initials for the Confederate States of America, and it is decorated with a shield with three bars and eight stars, all surrounded with four tulip-like flowers. Turning the jar clockwise, the enthusiasm for Confederate victory becomes more violent, with a ghastly image of a figure hanged from gallows above the initials A-L painted near the base. Coupled with the initials, the figure's distinctly long, thin legs and hairstyle suggests that it is intended to represent Abraham Lincoln. Other decorative elements include the notation of a four and four hash marks under the handle for the storage capacity. The Confederate shield and Abraham Lincoln's fate align fitting into a growing iconography for the Confederacy. However, turning the jar clockwise again muddles the matter a bit. Opposite the side from the CSA shield is a different one with stripes, also surrounded by four tulips. The word at the top of the shield has been faded a bit, probably during the firing process, but the beginnings of union remain visible. Rotating the jar once more completes the confusing narrative, as now a different figure is hanged, with the name Jeff D scrawled underneath. The key to comprehending the jar, I contend, lies in the face under the lug handle. Eyes narrowed and teeth bared, this is the epitome of frustration, perhaps with the need to choose a side, and anger directed into equal fates for the leaders of the Union and the Confederacy. So given the jar's attributed origins in Richmond, let's consider Virginia's specific political context during this period, which is less of a march to secession than one would perhaps expect given the state's outsized role in the war. Few Virginians in the public sphere made arguments against the institutions of slavery or white supremacy, to be certain. But many in the state, in the Commonwealth rather, fought against the idea of leaving the Union as the only means to preserve those institutions. In January 1861, a Richmond area legislator warned his constituents about disunionists who wished to bring about secession, claiming that, quote, this union, which, if our internal dissensions can be allayed, is destined in glory, in wealth, and in power to outstrip all other governments, can be preserved intact, can be maintained with equal rights to all the parties to it if Virginia will pursue a determined but yet considerate course. End quote. And then presciently warned that, quote, disunion is a remedy for none of the ills Virginia has to deal with. Its effect on her and the other border states would be particularly disastrous. End quote. Even as late as April 4th, 1861, two thirds of Virginia's secession convention voted against a secession ordinance. Besides a general reluctance to leave the United States, Virginia had its own internal fissure with which to contend. Slavery's central role in secession was not lost on contemporaries, pitting enslavers in the eastern regions of the Commonwealth against Westerners who were far less invested in the institution of slavery. And this map should, uh, shows the actual distribution of uh, slaves according to the 1860 census. As you can see, the higher concentration of the East, it makes it very clear. 
Furthermore, Westerners implied their proximity to the North would put them at greater risk than those Easterners who were pushing for secession. As one assemblyman stated during deliberations over sending representatives to the secession conference in South Carolina in 1860, quote, it was useless to talk of secession without war. The Ohio River would be a blaze of fire in 30 days after the Union was dissolved. And he thought he was as much interested as gentlemen living far from what would be the seat of war, end quote. Ultimately, the events at Fort Sumter brought about Virginia's secession, but not intact. The western portions of the state in turn seceded and eventually formed West Virginia as a state in the Union in 1863. Re-examining the jar within this context of political fracture within the state of Virginia, the number of, bars the number of stars rather, atop the Confederate state's shield becomes critical. Unlike the official stars and bars, which first numbered seven after the initial seven states' secession, and then nine after Virginia and North Carolina joined in the spring of 1861, this shield is topped by eight stars. While the decorator could simply have mistaken the number, I believe this was an intentional decision, marking the moment of Virginia's entry into the Confederacy. The decorator's violent treatment of both sides' leaders also becomes more explicable in the context of Fort Summer. Sumter, and I would draw your attention to the number of stars on the flag and the number of stars over um, on this envelope and the number of stars over the shield, uh, sorry, the cartouche rather. Um, so they're consistently adding stars with each one of these states that see it. So it is a sort of mobile iconography as it were. During the battle at Fort Sumter, President Abraham Lincoln sent supplies, not additional troops to the fort to avoid appearing as an aggressor and thereby tempted the Confederate States newly elected President Jefferson Davis into launching an attack. Davis in turn accurately believed that other slave states, especially Virginia, would secede from the Union and join the cause if war broke out. If this decorator or commissioner were a politically astute pro-slavery unionist, it would not be a stretch for him to conceive of Virginia's position in the war as a tug of war between two treasonous gamblers deserving of identical fates. Richmond's main producers of salt glazed stoneware were likewise caught in the crossfires of these exchanges. According to the U.S. Manufacturer's Census for 1860, there were two pottery ware, pottery ware manufacturers in Henrico County at that time, the Kesey and Parr stoneware, fact, stoneware Pottery in the Rockets neighborhood in the city of Richmond, and Stephen B. Sweeney's pottery on his farm in the eastern part of the county. In 1860, each pottery was listed as employing 10 male hands. At Kesey and Parr, many of these hands were members of the David Parr family. Formerly a China dealer in Baltimore, David Parr relocated to Richmond around 1852 with the support of Baltimore salt glazed stoneware manufacturer David Malden Perrine. In 1857, Parr entered into a partnership with auctioneer Thomas Kesey, which lasted until 1862, when Parr brought his sons David Parr Jr., John L., and James into the partnership. Although previous scholarship has suggested that the Parrs were Quakers, therefore pacifists and possibly abolitionists, contemporary accounts in newspapers suggest that the Parr family was deeply involved with the Methodist Episcopal Church in Rockets by the mid-1850s. They were also not anti-slavery. <clears throat> in 1853, David Parr advertised that a man named Billy Holmes, who he had rented from Captain Thomas Atkinson, had self-emancipated from his pottery at Rockets and offered a reward for his return. Furthermore, it appears that at least one of the Parr sons fought for the Confederate States. As David Parr placed an advertisement in Richmond papers to be copied nationally, requesting information about Private John L. Parr, taken prisoner at Front Royal, Virginia, in August of 1864. However, Kesey and Parr employed potters of a range of political persuasions. David Parr wrote on behalf of a Quaker, Tilleman Vestal, after he was imprisoned in Richmond for objecting to his enlistment in the Confederate Army due to his pacifist beliefs, and Vestal subsequently worked at the Parr Pottery for several years. Another possible employee, Joseph B. Ramey, enlisted in the Confederate Army in 1862 and was injured in 1864. Most importantly, Parr's employees also included George Newman Fulton, an Ohio native who enlisted in the Union Army in 1862. After the war, Fulton eventually founded his own potteries on the western side of Virginia, first in Allegheny County and then possibly Botetourt County. 
Extant works from his own potteries are covered in elaborate expressive brushwork decorations, as you can see here, either in cobalt or also manganese. They're often helpfully paired with a very large signature. Uh, for this reason, some Fulton scholars believe that this jar, with all of its um, both Union and Confederate symbols, um, is evocative of his of Fulton Unionist, Fulton's Unionist views amid his location in Richmond at the onset of the Civil War. The other pottery, the Stephen B. Sweeney family, was more visibly dedicated to slavery, slavery in the Confederate cause than the Pars. Uh, the pottery was part of a larger farm operation. In the 1850 and 1860 census, he, uh, Stephen B. Sweeney is listed as a farmer, and his son, Stephen Sweeney Jr., is noted as a farm manager. It's younger individuals like Sweeney's younger son, Charles H., or um, hired hands who are noted as potters in that census. Sweeney also enslaved 26 people in 1850 and 23 people in 1860. While most probably labored on the farm, it is possible that some individual's labor was used in the pottery. Other individuals within Sweeney's household um, included a white man, Edward J. Clark, um, a free black potter named Watt Green, who was listed in 1850, and several other sons, as I mentioned. Both Stephen Sweeney Jr. and Charles H. Sweeney served in the Confederate Army. Because of its proximate, proximity to Bailey and Four Mile Creeks off of the James River, the pottery and property itself was also caught in the middle of several Union attempts to overtake Confederate troops and seize Richmond. So there is a possibility that this particular jar was created out of that struggle as well. Like many of the James River potteries, the Parr and Sweeney pottery stoneware objects share common characteristics, and discerning between the two can be difficult. Moreover, after Stephen B. Sweeney's death in 1862, the entire property was sold at auction, and David Parr purchased many of his supplies and materials, <laughs> meaning that stamps and other identifiers were used at both locations. Uh, further demonstrating the potential for exchange between the potteries, Watt Green, um, who was listed at working at Sweeney's in the 1850 census, is listed in the 1869 Richmond City Directory as an employee at Parr's Pottery. It is important to remember that these were quasi-industrial potteries, each with nearly a dozen men at work, creating utilitarian wares in substantial batches. Laborers came and went, and they also worked in various capacities. There is a distinct possibility that the individual who formed the par jar on the wheel was different than the one who created the lug handles, and it is highly likely that someone else applied the cobalt decorations, and furthermore, this could have been a piece commissioned for a specific patron. So, allowing for a little conjecture, it is easy to imagine a decorator or potter placing this jar in the kiln, anti-Confederacy images turned away from peers' eyes, and, or anti-Union ones for that matter, and hiding it amongst all of the other stacks of jars, churns, and chamber pots. The decorator's imagery could have been inspired by any number of visual sources, but the sardonic nature of the hanged figures correlates with the tone of contemporary political cartoons, which had become more abundant in the United States in the mid-19th century. Regular publication of political cartoons in widely circulating media was accelerated by the popularity of Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, first published in 1855, and Harper's Weekly and Vanity Fair soon followed in 1857. The South had its own publication, Southern Punch, <laughs> which was added to the fray in 1860. Other popular prints, such as those by Curry and Ives, further added to this plethora of visual culture and iconographic permutations in the years leading up to and during the Civil War. Hanging Jefferson Davis was a common theme in political cartoons from the beginning of the war. In this Curry and Ives print from 1861, Davis is draped in the stars and bars, again, seven stars, standing on a platform at the gallows. Union soldiers also sang songs about hanging Jefferson Davis from the old sour apple tree from the beginning of the war, here documented in sheet music, and this became another popular treatment of the Confederate president in contemporary media. The depiction of Jefferson Davis on the jar is now somewhat vague, possibly because of uh, the firing or, or perhaps a tentative initial application, but that of Abraham Link Lincoln is distinct and easily comprehensible, even without the initials. Contemporary characters of Lincoln, including those that portrayed him in a positive light, like this one, exaggerated the tall statement's long legs. 
Likewise, the figure on the jars, uh, the figure on the jars, odd splayed legs, frequently are depicted in a similar manner in political cartoons. Further emphasizing his physique, this position echoes the number, the numerous depictions of Lincoln riding a split rail that proliferated during his presidential candidacy. Both of the hanged presidents are portrayed in a manner that evokes dancing with their bent arms and legs, rather than the limp bodies associated with this gruesome act, suggesting that the images are intended to be sarcastic and humorous. You can almost see a smile on the Abraham Lincoln figure's face. The expression on the jar painted under the jar's handle, uh, on the, the expression on the face rather, painted on the, under the jar's handle, is also found in contemporary political cartoons, especially those that depict Miss Columbia, a personification of the United States. In one, published in uh, Harper's Weekly in 1860, Miss Columbia is fashioned as a school teacher, presiding over a rowdy classroom of misbehaving congressmen and students. Her large eyes are narrowed and angular, registering her frustration with representatives from the North and South alike. In another cartoon from Harper's Weekly, this time published in 1861, Columbia has awoken and grasps a ghoulish figure, likely Jefferson Davis, by his neckerchief. Her face is arranged in the same firm-lipped, angered expression as before, but this time she stands in front of a portrait, likely intended to invoke the spirit of a founding father. Rather than directly mimicking Columbia, I believe that the decorator is a, applied the typical conventions of the period that were used to convey an individual's frustration and anger, as seen in these images of Columbia, to a character of George Washington. <clears throat> the cobalt sweep over the handle terminates in slightly curved ends, much like the curls of a powdered wig around the face. The face's toothy grimace implies clenched jaws and references one of the first president's most infamously unseen features in his portraits. He sees what is happening to the United States and is not pleased. As much as this face represents George Washington's anger at his legacy state, it also likely serves as a self-portrait of the artist's emotional state. Admittedly, without knowing precisely who the decorator or potter was, and having some documentation of their attitudes, or if the piece was ex executed for a client. Assigning a particular perspective or emotion to an artist runs a bit of a risk. However, no matter how humorous, the treatment assigned to Lincoln and Davis, as well as the conflicted nature of representing symbols of both sides in the Civil War, speaks to considerable frustration. If representative of the views of the decorator, George Washington becomes a proxy for the self. The Washington slash decorator's face therefore serves as a marker of bearing witness, of watching the country deteriorate into chaos and, whether due to death or position, being able to do little to stop it. As historian Michael E. Woods argues, Americans' understanding of emotions leading up to and during the Civil War played a critical role in their comprehension of political events and decision-making processes. In many instances, Emotions were cited as the common bonding force for the country's disparate groups. Good feelings, or maintaining good feelings, rather than political or national ties, allowed the states to remain joined together harmoniously. Disruptions to these good feelings, sparked by abolitionists in the North or fanned by secessionists in the South, would, in this framing, framing naturally dissolve those bonds. Woods contends that various political groups played upon these ideas that emotional bonds could form communities to then encourage the creation of separate sectional identities, essentially utilizing the discourse of emotion to amplify the key political and economic issues of this period. Similarly, Kyle Osborne asserts that the kind of righteous anger and hatred of the Yankee encouraged by secessionists served as a unifying element for Southerners who, in actuality, had little more of a singular national identity than the remainder of the United States. Thus, the anger and frustration on display on the sides of the Richmond jar can be seen as twofold, partly at the leaders or groups that the decorator perceived as leading the country into war and chaos, and partly with the loss of an emotional community. Where, in this moment of mutual distrust and hatred, does the decorator belong? This storage jar, therefore, illuminates one of the forgotten paths that many Americans tread in the early stages of the Civil War, that of the unwilling participant. It offers an important reminder that, no matter our contemporary perspective or the predominance of particular tropes, the individuals who lived through major historical events often experience them in a much more confusing fashion than our hindsight affords. 
Rather than the black and white clarity of historians' texts, the actual moment was, for many, a hopeless blend of blue and gray. Thank you.